so the theme today is exploring numbers. Um, I asked you to have a think about the question from underground mathematics, which was um, this one, scary sum. And I hope you've had time to think about it, to look at it, realize what you need to do, that you want to rationalize the denominator. How do you go about doing that? Once you've done that, you reach a solution. Um, if you haven't yet done that, feel free to have a go at that later. Um, there's a link there and that page also has a solution section so you can see if you got it right. Um, so then I asked you to go away and have a think about the question of rationalizing denominator for the fraction one over one plus cube root of two. And I'd be curious to know whether any of you manage it. Feel free to type something in the chat. Did you manage to rationalize the denominator of that one? Yes, excellent. We've got one yes. So at least one person has managed. Um, I don't know whether the others have tried or whether you tried and got stuck or whether you didn't have time to have a look. Let's look at a few different ways that we might approach a question like this. So one thing that you might try is the typical thing of what do you do when you had one over one plus square root of two. So you might say, let's take one over one plus cube root two and multiply it by one minus cube root two over one minus cube root two. And oh, on the top, I still get my one minus cube root two, but on the bottom, when I multiply it, I get one minus cube root of two squared, which is one minus cube root of four, and I'm not done. You could try it again. Well, what happens if I multiply by one plus cube root of four to try, try and sort of simplify that? Then I get one minus cube root of 16, which is um, twice cube root of two, and I'm sort of almost back to where I started. So that method doesn't work. And you could play and say, well, I've got cube root twos, cube root fours, let's try something like one over one plus cube root two times well, maybe maybe I want to times it by something that has um, some constants or some real number, so some nice simple rational number plus something times cube root two. You can multiply that by that and see if that works, and it finds it doesn't. So let's try and have something times cube root of four as well. So I'll multiply by a plus b cube root two plus c cube root of four. And you can multiply that out and you get some nice equations. So on the top you get the same, but on the denominator, you're going to get a plus b cube root two plus c cube root four. And now we're multiplying one cube root two, so I get plus a cube root two plus, now when am I, cube root two times cube root two gives me b cube root of four. Cube root two times cube root four is two, so I get a plus two c on my denominator. And you get the same thing on the numerator, a plus b cube root two plus c cube root four. And you want this to be an integer. So you want a plus b to be zero, so these two cancel, and b plus c to be zero, so these two cancel. So let's write down, you want a plus, want a plus b to equal zero, you want b plus c to equal zero and a plus two c 
we want to be an integer. So e.g. you could take a equals 1, b equals minus 1, c equals 1, that gives you a plus 2c is 3, and we're done. So what you end up with is that is equal to 1 minus twice cube, sorry, 1 minus cube root 2 plus cube root 4 all over 3. And hopefully that's that makes sense. Let me take a photograph of this. I can save. Screen save. Um, so that's one way of doing it. And it relied upon us sort of guessing the form of this denominator here. And as long as we include everything that we need to include, we're good. But it then comes down to solving a bunch of equations and linear equations are sort of messing around with that. It doesn't necessarily show that much about the structure of this and why this technique works. So I'd like to now have a go and think about a completely different way of thinking about this problem. So I'm going to clear the screen and let's start again. So we've got this number on the bottom here, 1 plus cube root 2. So let's call that x. So we'll call that 1 over x is equal to that. So we've got x is equal to 1 plus cube root of 2. And we can sort of turn it into quite a nice equation for x if we subtract 1. And cube root of 2 is this sort of strange number. We, we, can't, we can write down a decimal approximation to it, but the only thing we really actually know about cube root 2 is that when you cube it, you get 2. So if we cube this whole equation, we get x minus 1 all cubed is equal to 2, which is a nice expression, nice equation that tells us something about this number 1 plus cube root 2. It's a number that satisfies this equation. It's not the only solution to this equation. There are two complex solutions to it as well, but it is a root of this equation. Um, and we can, we can um, expand it if we like. So we can write that as x cubed minus 3x squared plus 3x minus 1 is equal to 2. So we can get a polynomial equation out of it. x cubed minus 3x squared plus 3x minus 3 is equal to 0. So our number 1 plus cube root 2, that denominator there, is a root of this polynomial. And that's all very nice and well and good, but how does that help us with our original question, which is, can we um, rationalize the denominator in this? Okay, so we've written a nice equation, but in some sense, who cares? there's a really nice trick you can do at this point, which is we'll rearrange that polynomial equation. Really, really, really simple rearrangement. We'll just move the constant to the other side. Minus 3x squared plus 3x is equal to 3. And with that equation, we can factorize the left-hand side, take out a factor of x.
And suddenly you might notice that we can now rearrange this to get an expression for one over x, just by dividing both sides by x and then by three. So one over x is equal to x squared minus three x plus three all over three. And I now have an expression for one over x. I now like to write it ideally in terms of numbers rather than x's. So I can work out what x squared is. I can work out minus three x and I can work out plus three. So if I substitute x is equal to one plus cube root two on the right hand side, right hand side, I get an expression for one over x. And I'm not going to do the calculations, but that's just simple, simple calculation at this point. So this is a very, very different way of thinking. I've started with um, I've started with my x is equal to one plus cube root two. I've rearranged it to turn it into a polynomial. And from that polynomial, I can then, with a very, very easy re rearrangement, deduce an expression for one over x. And from that expression, I can then substitute x in, multiply everything out, and I deduce a way of rationalizing denominator, which is potentially quite surprising. Um, this process required me to spot that there was a nice way to rearrange the equation or to, to turn this x equals one plus cube root two. There was a relatively nice way to get to this point. What happens if you're dealing with something like no, one over one plus cube root of two plus twice cube root of four, something that's much uglier? So let me clear this page and I'll show one other um, way of doing it. Oh, so if I clear that, let me present one third way of doing it and I won't go all the way to the end with this one. So again, I've got one over x is equal to this. So I have x is equal to one plus cube root of two. So I'll have a look at x squared. What's x squared? Well, I can use binomial theorem. I get one plus twice cube root two plus cube root four. Or I can look at x cubed, and then I can look at x cubed. So I just go up in the power of x, start with x, then look at x squared, then look at x cubed. And again, by binomial expansion, one plus three cube root two plus three cube root four plus cube root two cubed, which is two. So that's three plus three cube root two plus three cube root four. And now I've got three expressions. I've got an expression for x, an expression for x squared, and an expression for x cubed. Um, if I want to get a polynomial in x with integer or rational coefficients that equals zero, um, I want to sort of eliminate all these cube root twos and cube root fours. With just x and x squared, I've got this cube root four hanging around. There's no way I can eliminate it. But now I've got two expressions that involve cube root four. So I can eliminate cube root four by subtracting x cubed minus three x squared is equal to three minus three times one is zero. Three cube root two minus six cube root two is minus three cube root two. And now I can eliminate the cube root two by adding on some x terms. So if I add on three x, 
I get three and I'm done. Or I can subtract three from both sides if you prefer. So without any cleverness of spotting, oh, I can subtract one and then cube, just by squaring it and then cubing it and trying to eliminate the non-integer parts, I can end up with a polynomial. So I've now got three different ways to rationalize the denominator of this fraction. The first way was to try multiplying by top and bottom by a plus b cube root 2 plus c cube root 2 squared, which is cube root 4. The second was to say x is equal to 1 plus cube root 2, find a polynomial that x satisfied by cleverly manipulating the expression. And the third was start, similar to the second, starting with x equals 1 plus cube root 2 again, but now just squaring it and cubing it and trying to find some sort of way of adding multiples of them to each other in order to eliminate all of the cube roots to, to the point where I'm left with just an integer or a rational number. And then from this point, I can do exactly the same as I did before. I can take out a factor of x, write x times x squared minus 3x plus 3 is equal to 3, and then rearrange it to get 1 over x. Excellent. So mathematicians are rarely, let me clear this, mathematicians are rarely satisfied with, um, with just one simple case. They want to say, could we generalize? So let's see if we can generalize. We like to look for patterns. We like to generalize. We like to solve problems. We're problem-solving pattern recognition machines. Um, so let's look at a generalization of what we've been doing. Um, and at the end of the lecture, I'll give you some ideas of where this might go beyond, um, beyond rationalizing the denominator. So we've now got some techniques that will help us rationalize many denominators. So what we just did was we writing x equals 1 plus cube root 2, we got this polynomial equation for x. And what we're going to do is we're going to say that a number which is a root of a polynomial is an algebraic number. So we're going to call 1 plus cube root 2 an algebraic number. You've already learned about real numbers, about integers, about rational numbers, and so forth. So this is a new type of number. It comes within the numbers you've learned about before they are real or complex numbers, but it's a special type, which is a solution to a polynomial equation. They're called algebraic numbers. You may have used the term third at school, but third is a fairly vague term. Different people mean different things by it. Um, they probably wouldn't include all sorts of algebraic numbers. Would you call one a third? even though one is an algebraic number. So we have a very precise term here called algebraic number. And using that technique, we developed of writing this, the polynomial as x times something is equal to a constant. You can rationalize any denominator if the denominator is algebraic. So let's take what we've just said, a um, number which is the root of that a polynomial is an algebraic number. Um, let's write it a bit more formally. And the reason for writing things formally is because if you've got a formal definition of something, you can then work with it. You can prove results about it. So let's be more formal. Um, I've a few times mentioned the word rational number. Let's just make sure we all know what we mean by that. A rational number A, we call A a rational number if we can write A is equal to M over N, where M and N are integers and n is non-zero. So that's a formal way of saying something you're probably very familiar with already. So three quarters minus seven thirds, four, zero, they're all rational numbers because they can all be written as integer divided by non-zero integer. So with that in mind, here's the definition of algebraic numbers. So let me walk you through this. A real or complex number C is called an algebraic number 
if it is a root of a polynomial, a n x to the n plus a n minus 1 x to the n minus 1 plus dot 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 plus a 1 x plus a 0, where the coefficients a n, a n minus 1, dot dot dot, a 1 and a 0 are all rational numbers. And just to make sure that everyone knows what I meant by that, a root of a polynomial f of x, um, we say that c is a root of the polynomial f of x if f of c is equal to 0. So this polynomial, it's not a polynomial equation. I'm not saying a x to the n plus, dot dot plus a zero equals zero. It's just the polynomial expression itself. Okay, so as an example, the fifth root of seven is algebraic because it's a root of the polynomial x to the five minus seven. Because if you stick fifth root of seven into that, you get zero. And Critically, the coefficients of this polynomial are x to the 5 has coefficient 1, then the next four coefficients, x to the 4, x to the 3, x to the 2, and x to the 1, they all have zero coefficients, and then the constant is minus 7. So 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, and minus 7, they're all rational. Therefore, cube fifth root of 7 is al an algebraic number, or is algebraic. So let's take that definition and make a few comments about it. Um, observation one, every rational number is algebraic. Why is that? So if I take a number, say, three-fifths, oops, if I take x equals three fifths, then I've got five x equals three. That's what I mean by division. I mean, what number satisfies the equation five x equals three? And you can write that as five x minus three equals zero. So three fifths satisfies the conditions for being an algebraic number. And if you have any rational number, m over n, you can multiply both sides by n, and you get nx equals m. So nx minus m is equal to zero. And since n and m are integers, that means that x is an algebraic number. So that's the first observation. Um, second observation, Every solution of a polynomial equation with integer coefficients is algebraic. And that's because if you've got a polynomial with integer coefficients, every integer is itself a rational number. And so every solution of integer polynomial equation with integer coefficients is satisfies definition of algebraic number. That's another straightforward observation. Um, here's a little subtler is if I take an algebraic number, say three-fifths or fifth root of seven or whatever it might be, it satisfies many different polynomial equations or many different polynomials with rational coefficients. Or more better wording would have been it's a root of many different polynomial polynomials with rational coefficients. Because if I take x to the five minus seven, I could just multiply it by two. So I would get um, x to the, oops, sorry, Ooh, you, I, full screen. Now, can you still see my screen? Could someone type yes in the chat box if you can? Excellent, thank you. Um, apologies for that, I hit the wrong button. Um, so if you've got x equals, so I've got, um, so 
So I've got x, to, I was saying x to the 5 minus 7 is a polynomial satisfied or has fifth root of 7 as a root. So does twice x to the 5 minus 14 or half x to the 5 minus 7 halves or one seventh of x to the fifth minus 1. So every algebraic number in this way will satisfy many, many, many different polynomials with rational coefficients. And that's sort of quite inconvenient if you want to sort of specify rational um, algebraic numbers in nice, unique ways. So one thing about these is this one's got x to the fifth at the beginning, this one's got 2x to the fifth at the beginning, 1 seventh x to the 5 minus 1 has 1 seventh at the beginning as the leading coefficient. So one thing we could do is define a polynomial which has a leading coefficient of 1 and see if that helps us. So we'll say a polynomial is called monic if its leading coefficient is 1. So monic polynomial, it has the same form, it's exactly the same as before, but now instead of being a n x to the n, it's just 1 x to the n, the highest degree. And we say that the degree of this polynomial is n, that's the largest power of x appearing. So let's, let's ask the question again. Um, if I take an algebraic number now, um, and I require the polynomial to be monic, would that be enough to ensure we have a unique polynomial that, for which this algebraic number is a root? So for example, does square root two have a unique polynomial? Well, I know that for square root two, I've got um, x squared minus two, and root two is a root of x squared minus 2. It satisfies x squared minus 2 equals 0. I can't multiply this polynomial by 2 or 3 or 5 or whatever because then it wouldn't be monic anymore. But I could multiply it by say x. So square root of 2 is still a root of this polynomial. So I still don't have uniqueness. It would be really nice to have a unique polynomial that sort of characterizes any algebraic number. So I can do, so the answer to the question is, is requiring the polynomial to be monic good enough? No, it's not good enough. Let's see if we can make it good enough. What would we need to do? So we've got the monic. That's our first definition I'm keeping up here. We'll introduce another definition. If C is an algebraic number, then the minimum polynomial of C is the monic polynomial of smallest degree with rational coefficients that is satisfied by C. So for the square root of two example, x cubed minus two x is not of smallest degree, that has degree 3, but x squared minus 2 has degree 2. And we can't find a linear polynomial, x plus a constant, which is satisfied by square root of 2. So the minimum polynomial of square root of 2 is x squared minus 2. And there is a theorem, which I'll ask you to prove in the example sheet, that every algebraic number has a unique minimum polynomial. So if I give you 1 plus cube root of 2, as we looked at at the beginning, once you've found a polynomial of smallest degree, you know you're done. There is no smaller degree polynomial. And we'll write m of c to mean the minimum polynomial of the algebraic number c. So the, you, we can deal with algebraic numbers as if they were ordinary numbers in some senses. So if you've got two algebraic numbers, A and B, then if you add them together, subtract or subtract them or multiply them, you 
get another algebraic number. And if b is non-zero, you can divide a divided by b, you also get an algebraic number. So if you're dealing in the world of algebraic numbers, you can do normal arithmetic with them, just as you would do with rational numbers. You can add, add subtract, multiply, and divide, and you remain within the world of algebraic numbers. And in fact, we can do something even more astonishing. Um, just now we said that if you start with rational numbers and you solve polynomial equations, you get these new things called algebraic numbers. Could you do the same? If you start with um, algebraic numbers as coefficients, so you start take a polynomial equation with an algebraic numbers as coefficients, would you get some sort of super algebraic numbers? So if you solve the equation square root of two times x squared, I don't know, let's write something down. Um, if you try to solve the equation square root of two times x squared minus cube root of five x plus three quarters equals zero. So that's a polynomial equation with algebraic numbers as coefficients. If you find a solution to that, would that be an algebraic number itself or would that be something new? Would we end up with even more numbers? And there's a theorem which says, no, this is as far as we can go. If you take a, if C is a root of a polynomial, where the coefficients are algebraic numbers, as I just wrote up, then the root itself, C itself, is an algebraic number. So this sort of is as far as we can go down this road. If you were to try to solve an equation like 2 to the x equals 3, that's not a polynomial equation, then you get new numbers and you end up with logarithms or what, what other things you may end up with if you allow yourself to have all sorts of powers x in a power or other things or use trigonometric functions. But if we restrict ourselves to polynomials, that's as far as you can go. You can't go beyond the algebraic numbers. Okay, um, one more idea that goes down this line is a little sort of further away from our question of rationalizing the denominator and, and finding those polynomials. There's within the rational numbers that we're very familiar with, we've got these special numbers called integers. In fact, you learned about integers long before you learned about rational numbers. Um, the integers one, two, three, at least you, and the negative numbers came later, but integers are special and have a special place within the world of rational numbers. And if you divide two integers, then you get a rational number turns out that in the world of algebraic numbers, some algebraic numbers behave a bit like integers, and some of them behave more like rationals. So how do we get this concept of integers in the algebraic numbers? Um, so we do the following. We say if C is algebra an algebraic number and all of the coefficients of its minimum polynomial m of C are integers, then C is called an algebraic integer. So um, what would an example of that be? Well, we've seen a few already. Um, square root of 2, its minimum polynomials, x squared minus 2. So that's an algebraic integer. 1 plus cube root of 2 satisfies the polynomial x cubed minus 3x squared plus 3x minus 3. And we noted earlier that we couldn't find a polynomial with rational coefficients that is satisfied with just x and x squared. That We noted that when we were looking at x and x squared and seeing could we eliminate the cube root of 4. No, we couldn't. We needed to go up to x cubed to be able to do that. So it satisfies this polynomial, x cubed minus 3x squared plus 3x minus 3, and we couldn't find a degree two polynomial that did the job. So 
this must be the minimum polynomial of 1 plus cube root of 2. So 1 plus cube root of 2 is also an algebraic integer. If you look at x to the n minus a, then if a is a, let's say a is a, pos is a positive prime number, so there's no issues around factorizing or it being some, some nice factor. But if we do that, then it's very easy to see that this is a mon polynomial. It's satisfied by the nth root of a. And so the nth root of a is also an algebraic integer. So you've got these sort of very nice algebraic integers. But what about a half? The minimum polynomial of a half is 2x minus 1. So the, sorry, that's the, that's not a monic polynomial. So the monic polynomial that it satisfies is x minus a half. So it satisfies the polynomial x minus half. Half is not an integer. So half is not an algebraic integer. So there are some examples of algebraic integers and one example of a not algebraic integer. And so we can just make one observation about these that every ordinary integer n is an algebraic integer because x minus n equals zero has integer coefficients. And every algebraic in integer is an algebraic number just because its integers are rational. Um, and they behave in the way we'd expect uh, integers to behave. If you've got, um, I'll do the second theorem first, if you've got two algebraic integers just as with ordinary integers, if you add them or subtract them or multiply them, then you get another algebraic integer. Um, the first thing was, if you've got an ordinary rational number, just like I gave the example with a half, um, then R is an algebraic integer if and only if it's an ordinary integer, because its minimum polynomial is x minus R. So let me write x minus R up there. The minimum polynomial of R is the polynomial x minus R. I should also observe that if a and b are algebraic integers, then a divided by b in general is not an algebraic integer. Um, I have no that in general. That's there are cases obviously if b is equal to one, for example, then a over b will be an algebraic integer. But in general, dividing two algebraic integers does not give you an integer, just as when you divide two algebraic to ordinary integers, you don't typically get an ordinary integer. And there's another nice little theorem which we're not going to prove, but if A is an algebraic number, then there's an ordinary integer n and an algebraic integer b with A equals b divided by n. That's not particularly difficult to prove, but um, we're not going to do that. Okay, so let me say just a few more words about these things and with, um, with that, we will finish for today. Um, is every real number algebraic? So we know that not every real number is an integer. We know every, not every real number is a rational number because you will see in a proof that square root of two is not rational. But now I've given you lots more numbers. I've given you all the algebraic numbers. Is every real number algebraic? Or even is every complex number algebraic? And the answer to that question turns out to be no. Um, and in a way that you will learn this term in numbers and sets course, if you're doing the maths course, is in fact very few numbers are algebraic. Vanishingly small proportion of all real numbers is algebraic. They're the only ones that we deal with. Oh, sorry. No. I, I was about to say something completely wrong. Um, but it turns out very, very, very few numbers are algebraic. Most numbers are not. Um, and numbers which are not algebraic are called transcendental. 
turns out that figuring out whether a number is algebraic or transcendental is a hard, hard, hard question. Um, the first one that was done was E. Charles Hermite proved in 1873 that E is transcendental. And a few years later, Ferdinand von Lindemann managed to prove that pi is transcendental. Um, the proofs are accessible. They've been simplified over the years. And there's a relatively straightforward proof that uses arguments from algebra together with arguments from calculus and approximating integrals and a very, very nice obvious result that if you've got a sequence of numbers, that, a sequence of integers that tend to zero, eventually the integers must all be zero. And it turns out that very simple result is a, is a critical idea in the step in the proof to show that e and pi are transcendental. But then you ask questions like, okay, what happens if I add them together, pi plus e or pi times e or pi to the power of e? We have no idea if they're algebraic or not. Probably they're transcendental. I mean, most numbers are transcendental, so chances are they are transcendental, but we have no idea. We, nobody's managed to prove it. On the other hand, um, it has now been proved, it was proved early in the 20th century, that e to the pi is transcendental. It is much, much, much easier to think about powers of e than it is to think about powers of pi. Um, a late mathematician from Cambridge uh, received a Fields Medal in the middle of the 20th century for proving that a large class of numbers are transcendental. Uh, it was such an achievement that he won a Fields Medal for that. And to this day, people are still working on pushing which numbers are transcendental, which numbers are algebraic and still lots of unsolved questions. If you want to read more about transcendental numbers, there's a Wikipedia page which might give you a, a nice gentle start or not so gentle start to transcendental numbers. Other directions you might go once you start thinking about algebraic numbers and transcendental numbers and this whole way of thinking about numbers more generally, uh, this leads us into a whole area of mathematics that's known as number theory. And the questions we've just asked about transcendental numbers, and I've just pointed out, are some of them beautiful. Many of them are very, very hard. There are some which might be easier, but many are hard. And if we go down this route of studying algebraic numbers and trying to describe them and trying to find more formal ways of working with them or more sophisticated ways of working with them, um, you end up in a beautiful area of maths known as algebraic number theory, or in a slightly different direction, you end up with analytic number theory. And that leads us towards problems like Fermat's last theorem, which turns out to find its home within the world of number theory. Many, many, many unsolved problems in number theory. Some of them are some of the most difficult unsolved problems in the whole of mathematics. Um, two of them are Millennium Prize problems, um, for which there's a million dollar reward prize waiting for anyone who manages to prove them. One is the Riemann hypothesis, and another one is the birch swinnerton and Dyer conjecture. The Riemann hypothesis, by the end of the first year, you'll probably know enough to be able to at least understand the, uh, an explanation of what the Riemann hypothesis is. birch swinnerton and Dyer conjecture, by the time you've done a year or two of PhD, if you go into this field, you might stand a chance of understanding the statement. Um, it is a much, much, much more technically sophisticated conjecture. Um, but the Andrew Wiles' proof of Fermat's last theorem was a first step along the way to the birch swinnerton and Dyer conjecture. So um, this is as far as I wanted to, to say today. Um, thank you very much. And that's the end of the formal lecture.